Today we're going to be introducing the East Dorset Village Historic District Project. Hi, I'm Ruth Stewart. I'm a longtime East Dorset resident and volunteer at the Dorset Historical Society. I'm a retired library media specialist from the Dorset School. When I began volunteering at the Historical Society, I was cataloging the collection. And during that process, I realized that there just wasn't very much information on East Dorset. And the mission of the Dorset Historical Society is to discover and collect materials. And so I set out to discover and collect materials <laughs> from East Dorset. What started my interest was a picture of a alleged mill on the little river that comes across the road just before the big turn on Dor um, Mad Tom Road. And so I indeed investigated that and discovered the foundation and subsequently I led a walk in East Dorset and I've done two more since then and I also did a walk in South Village um, and um, continue my activity at the Dorset Historical Society and this project. And <clears throat> I'm Michelle Fagan and um, I'm a textile conservator in private practice here in East Dorset and um, I'm a native Vermonter. I grew up in uh, Bennington and Rutland and um, graduated from UVM and left just about the same time that Ruth and her husband moved here as with so many other people who live here now moved here at the same time that I and a lot of my friends and siblings left but what really attracted me to um, living in East Dorset was I had visited here often as a child because growing up in Bennington we would visit the relatives both my mother and father are from West Rutland and um, so we would stop in to the cemetery here at St. Jerome's, which is where um, all of my mother's family um, is buried and continues to be buried. And my great-grandparents on my mother's side first came here to East Dorset back in the 1870s. And my great-grandfather, uh, Tom McCormick, um, apparently, according to the Dorset Historical Society, he was brought over here to be the, the crew chief down in the quarry for Mr. West. And um, so that's, that's even more reason why I chose to come back to East Dorset because my family roots are deep, deep in the marble industry, both, both sides of my family, in fact. So, so East Dorset was not uh, a new town for me. I, I have deep, deep memories of the marble, especially of East Dorset from, from when I was a child. So when we came back here, though, my husband John and I just moved back here um, four years ago, hadn't been gone for almost 50 years, <laughs> um, um, I especially wanted to live in East Dorset because I had these deep, deep childhood memories of um, lovely East Dorset. And so driving around the town now just four years ago, I again was noticing how beautiful the town is. Lovely little historic houses all over the place and uh, the marble sidewalks, and it was just everything that I remembered, even better, in fact, than I remember, frankly. <laughs> and um, because of my background in um, professional conservation and also my interest in historic architecture preservation, I wanted to make sure that the little village that we have could pretty much stay the same as what we see here today. <laughs> And so I contacted the, my colleagues that I knew in um, Montpelier at the State Division of Historic Preservation and asked, how do we start the process? And so because of that, uh, maybe three years ago, um, we have started the process with the state to try to get East Dorset Village identified as a historic district. And so I think we make a good team because she has all of the oral histories that she has been gathering over the years from living here and, and knowing everybody and the old pictures she has collected and the binders full of information that she has. And everything that I know, I have researched um, at, in the town property records, in the town grand list records, um, various histories of um, Mount Tabor, histories of Peru, all of that kind of fits into the history of East Dorset. And so that's why I think we make a, 
particularly good. And we both think we're a lot of fun. <laughs> and, <laughs> and either it, one of us can remember how we met. <laughs> well, and, and another piece of the history, evolution of the history project, was that we took a look at the uh, map that is the in the uh, Beers and Atlas 19 or 1869 yes. um, Atlas, and That's we discovered Atlas. that at that time, uh, in 1869, there were considerable marble mills here, there was a railroad, there was a railroad station, there was a school, there were two stores, a post office, there was considerable infrastructure already existed in 1869. And so that became sort of another impetus to, hey, look at all this history that kind of evolved uh, when the railroad came through in 1853 and let's see where the town has gone since then. So let's see. Um, the other piece of this is the evolution of East Dorset's growth was centered around the marble industry uh, and the arrival of the railroad. The, when the railroad came through, the hotel was built, there was already a church here. Well, there were two churches here. There was the Catholic Church and then there was the Congregational sure. Church. Um, so uh, the whole um, development and growth of the village was connected to the marble industry. <clears throat> so one of the questions we have gotten from um, friends and neighbors who have heard about the project is they're a little worried that um, if this lovely little village got a state historic designation that they couldn't do whatever they want to do to their properties. And so uh, in our various conversations with Montpelier and um, the state architectural historian up there, we posed that question to him and said, people down here, some people are worried what's going to happen to their properties and can they continue to do whatever they want to do. And he wrote back um, in an email um, and he said, quote, a survey for the state register or national register listing does not result in additional regulations. Such regulations would be put in place by the town as a design review district and that's a local public process. And so uh, maybe we should talk about the fact that on the west side of the mountain there is a national register district and that also has a zoning overlay such that that national district over there um, does require uh, neighborhood oversight and the people over there on the other side of the mountain if they live in that national register district they do have to have any anything they want to do to their house has to go before the local design review board it's called a design district that is not what we are doing all we are doing uh, would be similar to the Kent neighborhood also over there on the west side of the mountain the Kent neighborhood does not have any kind of design review overlay if somebody in the Kent neighborhood or somebody here in East Dorset Village wanted to paint their house pink with green shutters and a fire engine red door, you can do it. You can do anything you want to your property at any time uh, and, and that's the kind of project we're working on here. Now another reason for doing this project is because the town plan, the Dorset town plan, is supportive of ongoing efforts of the Dorset Historical Society and the state to map historic uh, areas in the town. And the town has um, committed to work with residents and the Dorset Historical Society and other groups to establish additional historic districts if warranted. And private, um, so um, not only do we have, um, the, we have multiple town re town support, it also provides um, a impression that, hey, here's a village that people care about, that they want to preserve the integrity of this village and um, keep it uh, as a, uh, a place of uh, interest to um, anybody who moves here or passes through.
Okay. So do you want to talk about, describe the process of what we have sure. to go through here? Um, first, we had to define the boundaries of the historic district, and they are Village Street, north and south, the entire block, and Mad Tom Road from Route 7 to the big turn in the road. Coming uphill. And there. it includes about 38 properties. Not all of the properties qualify as a historic building, but and they remain within the district, but just are not described. So the once we've defined the properties, and the other piece of this is that much of the history of East Dorset is gone now. For instance, the marble companies and the school and the railroad station well, and the two stores. The two stores are all gone, even though these were important pieces of the growth of East Dorset from the 1850s to the 1920s, say, um, there still will be um, part of the documentation as to the, the past. But at the present, um, the process, Michelle, would you like to outline that? Yeah, sure. So um, after we've determined approximately where the district is, and which streets are included, Pleasant Street also, Leary Lane of houses, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, then we have to write up a form, um, which the state supplied. It looks something like this, front and back, with photos attached. And that's a, a description of the architecture. What style of house is it? And um, for the Storset Village, it's almost always the Greek Revival um, period. Um, the gable front G Greek Revival houses look like this. They have the peak on the front or the um, eaves front Greek Revival. We have a couple of um, Gothic kind of houses that were built after the Civil War. And we have one house from the 20th century, which is Colonial Revival. Um, on um, Mad Tom Road. And so we have to write all that up, the complete description of, of what each house is like. And, and then also as part of that um, application form for each house, we have to discuss the uh, statement of significance. Why was this house significant in some way? Is it a good example of something? Um, did somebody important live there? That would be another example of um, why the house would be significant. And so we have used um, uh, copies of old maps. This is an 1856 map of all of Dorset. And the Beers Atlas map is this Atlas of Bennington. It's a whole volume called the Atlas of Bennington. And in here there are two pages full of maps just of Dorset. And this is these are maps of East Dorset, North Dorset, and South Dorset. And the lovely thing about these maps is not only are they just a map of all the buildings and roads that were there, but next to each dot on the map, they have handwritten the name of the family that was living there. So that's quite incredible that we have that kind of um, information that's available to us. So we started with both of the maps, and then we have um, used the town property records down at the town hall and have taken each house, well, we're in the process of, right? <laughs> we're in the process of researching each house from today's owner all the way back to these old maps. And that gives us a complete record of who owned the house. And from then, we start to pick up and put together a whole history of, oh, who, what family owned that house all these decades? And then, be because of the miracle of modern it technology and internet and Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org, all of those wonderful online resources that researchers now have, we've really been able to put together some very interesting stories of um, the history of uh, downtown Dorset, East Dorset Village that there's no living memory of these anymore. So let's see, Ruth, I think you have an interesting story you want to tell that we researched. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk about the two stores that existed in East Dorset. The, um, there was a store on Mad Tom Road just behind the Congregational Church. 
it came, was built, it, as near as we can tell, around um, 18, um, what is the date 50, on it? 18, around 1856. Um, there was a land transfer from the church to uh, an individual P.D. Ams. Now, the Ams family are a prominent family within the early history of East Dorset. They were the ones that Benjamin Ams built the house where the frost well drilling is now. And he was a prominent elder in the church. And his son, P.D. Ams, um, ran the store. It was managed by the um, by the New England Protective Union. This was a co-op that was established in 1849 to provide city markets with rural produce in exchange for produce to sell in the local market. And PDMs was the agent for that until he actually bought the property which records show was around 1863. And mind you, this was after the railroad came through. So all of this growth uh, sort of was spurred by the influx of the railroad. Uh, the other important piece to mention here is that the hotel was built, the, uh, what we now know as the Wilson House, uh, was built at the same time that the railroad came through, and um, uh, Michelle will probably reference that. Um, so PDMs owned and ran that uh, market uh, until um, it was sold in about 1898 to uh, Harvey Brophy. And Brophy ran it until 1926 when it burned down. Next, we have oral history of a of an individual that is 98 years old, and she lived in the house across the street, and she remembers standing in front of the window watching the fire burn, and her mother had, this was in February, and her mother had dressed she and her sister in their winter clothes in case they had to evacuate the house, which they did not have to do, but she remembers putting her hand on the window and feeling the heat. So that store burned down and it was never rebuilt and it remained sort of a foundation there between um, the, what was the, the Bowen House and the church. Um, the other store in town was the flat roof building which still exists and that was known as the, um, the Bowen store established by Bowen around 1861. Again, we have this railroad connection and two stores in the village supporting the town, which was mostly marble quarry workers and farmers. And Bowen ran the store until uh, 1870 when he sold it to J.M. Griffiths. Now, Griffiths was a grandfather, great grandfather to Bill Wilson. Bill Griffith Wilson. Bill Griffith Wilson. Um, and so you have that connection, Bill Wilson being the founder, uh, co founder of AA. And so the Griffins owned that store until eight, 1908. And this I learned from the current owner. I was not even aware of this particular piece of history, but the store burned completely to the ground in 1908, in February 1908. It was rebuilt that same year, and at the Dorset Historical Society, we have a copy of the specs for the rebuilding of that store. And it is totally detailed including everything from the materials to be used in the foundation to the materials to be used in the roof and the hardware and the, the covering, the wall coverings, everything totally the, the same. And as near as I can tell, the structure was almost identical to the original structure. I believe it was rebuilt to emulate what the first structure was. It still has the flat roof, and that flat roof building becomes an identifier in a lot of pictures of East Dorset. Um, it, um, 
was sold in, it was owned by the Griffins until um, 1926 when the store on Mad Tom Road burned down and Brophy subsequently bought Griffith's store. And so in modern time, if you talk to anybody, they know it as the Brophy store, but a lot of people really also identify it as the Griffith store. It remained a store until uh, about the 30s when the new highway uh, spur went around East Dorset Village and um, Howard Brophy built what we now know as the Jiffy Mart across the, the new highway and um, closed that, that store. Um, I think what should be noted uh, here too is the um, impact of the marble industry. If you look at East Dorset today, there's no, it's hard to tell if there was an active marble industry, but we have pictures of the marble mills that extended to the north of Mad Tom Road and to the south of Mad Tom Road all along the railroad. Those were gone about around 1930s and my supposition is that that material from those marble mills was used to help build the road to a fill for the new highway. Um, the impact of the marble industry is still evident today in uh, East Dorset Village with the, the raceway that goes just um, before you um, get to the post office coming off of Route 7, um, the marble sidewalks, the foundations, there are uh, marble uh, hitching posts and there's a couple of um, stepping marble stepping stones. So the impact of the marble industry is totally evident here today. The story that I'd like to talk about is um, the story of the Cochrane family. Um, Ira Cochrane, in particular, was the man who basically built East Dorset. The town that we see today was pretty much built by Ira Cochrane, son of John Cochrane. He, uh, John Cochrane, had raised his family in Londonderry, and then brought brought the family down here to very early, early East Dorset. In 1841, his son Ira inherited his father's place. Now, on the maps, you will always see um, properties with I. Cochrane next to them. And there are many, many properties listed as I. Cochrane. And those were all his. The um, 1868 Beers Atlas, especially, is loaded with um, little dots that say I. Cochrane next to them. Or they say Batchelder next to them. Ira's wife was, guess what, a Batchelder. So when you look at the Beers Atlas map, um, wherever you see the, the name I. Cochran written in, or wherever you see the name Batchelder written in, those were in-laws of Ira Cochran. Uh, the Kent House is located on the north side of Mad Tom Road. One of his sisters had married into the Kent family. When you see F. Harwood listed on the map, his youngest sister had married Franklin Harwood. When you see Cochrane and Morse Marble Company on the west side of uh, the railroad, um, that was his son-in-law because his daughter had married a Morse. When you see the Blake Barrows Hotel listed on the Beers Atlas map, his daughter had married Blake Barrows, and so Ira Cochran really uh, owned a lot of property to begin with, then sold it off, uh, and then built, built the hotel. He was originally a lumberman, by the way, and so when you look again at the Beers Atlas map, and also at the 1856 uh, Rice Harwood map, uh, a lumber spout is written there. And that refers to the two mile long wooden uh, skeleton that he and Mr. Manley wrote, built together to transport all of this lumber from up on the Peru mountain downtown uh, to the village. They had the contract to provide the railroad ties. And he was bringing, he was one of the directors of the Western Vermont Railroad Company. So he had his finger in the lumber industry. He owned a lot of land. 
He was a director of the railroad company when it came through town. He had a marble company. His daughter and son-in-law, he built the hotel and then had his daughter and son-in-law run it. Um, he was an in-law with uh, Franklin G. Harwood, another early lumberman, such that by the time the first uh, grand list was produced for Dorset, Ira Cochran was the wealthiest man in all of Dorset. Uh, but his is a story that has been largely lost to time. Uh, there is no living memory of uh, anybody knowing or remembering Ira, even the 98-year-old lady <laughs> would have no memory of Ira Cochran, and to date we have not found any Cochran um, descendants of Ira still here in um, East Dorset, Dorset, or anywhere in Vermont, but who knows, that could change tomorrow. <laughs> and so, it sh we should note too that um, Cochran, John Cochran was a local doctor Grandson with, with his Grandson uh, office of on um, Mad Tom Road, or not Mad Tom on, on Village, Village Street, Street. Um, and um, that was um, Ira's grandson, grandson, and he was a practicing physician in the uh, village area until the 40s, and well known. And uh, by I he died, I believe he died in 1948. Mm -hmm. So yes, there would be living memory of Doctor Doctor Cochran. So let's see, so now it's time to talk a little bit about an offshoot, a separate project that has evolved that will not be going to the state, and that is this oral history project that we've started up. And, and it, it just occurred to me, as Ruth and I were doing all of this research on the houses and the families of beautiful downtown East Dorset Village, is, is what we refer to it as, that actually there was still a lot of history being left out earlier history and there was there was a huge amount of history that has happened just in the time when Ruth moved here and I moved away another chapter in Vermont history has happened and so we have started now uh, an oral history project that some people have heard about and that is aimed at capturing everybody's story of how they came to be um, living in East Dorset did they choose East Dorset did they always grow up here at East Dorset did they go away, grow up, go away, and come back to East Dorset? So that's a separate project that, that will not be going into the state, of course. And um, can we say that those audio tapes are going to be at the Dorset, Dorset Historical so Society? They, they will be archived at the Dorset Historical Society and available for use there. As well as um, GNAT. We should yeah, give yeah. GNAT credit for Correct. also going yeah. to store these videos. Um, another outgrowth of this project was one that Michelle initiated to do a driving tour of East Dorset that encompasses areas away um, along Mad Tom Road, down Bowen Hill Road, on to uh, Route 7 to include places like Emerald Lake and um, the Frost Farm, uh, etc. Um, so as we have worked on this project, we realize that there is a lot more history to collect. For, for instance, South Village in East Dorset is another whole history project with the um, uh, Deming Tavern on the corner of Morris Hill Road and um, Village uh, Benedict Road, um, at, sort of as the, the basis for that whole district area. And then there's all of the North, Dor North Dorset area. So we encourage people who have memories of East Dorset um, to share our photos or whatever to give us a call and contact us and have us hear your stories. Um, we've already had some very unusual contacts as a result of uh, publicity there, or no publicity that has gone out about this project. One of, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it has. It continues to be a lot of fun. We we still we're meeting wonderful people. So and we're having a whole lot of aha moments True. as we go along. It's um, something that we hope to continue doing for quite a while. For a while. Thank you.